Good afternoon. Welcome to this event. And thank you so much to those who have joined us already and those that are joining. It's wonderful to have you here today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Rosa Siluri, and I'm actually uh, Associate Dean for International and Comparative Legal Studies here at GW Law School. And I wanna welcome you to the launching and presentation of the book Towards Uniformly Accepted Principles for Interpreting MFN Clauses, Striking a Balance, authored by our SJD alum, Nodred Piracha. And I want to first start by thanking and congratulating Nudra for her tremendous work, you know, in this SJD dissertation, which is now published. Um, when you look at this publication, when you see those pages and text and extensive research, this really evidences dedication, thorough and thought provoking analysis. And I had the honor of being part of her SJD dissertation committee. And I have to say, I found her dissertation to be groundbreaking and really impressive in the area of investment arbitration. I really respect tremendously, you know, the review and analysis of how MFN clauses have been analyzed and interpreted by tribunals and the scope, reach and limits of how tribunals should be treating agreements between states and investors. I also want to greatly acknowledge, you know, before we start our discussion today, I want to acknowledge um, the work of Professor Sean Murphy and also Judge Charles Brower and also Professor Stanimir Alexandrov, um, who really were instrumental, you know, in guiding and supporting Nudra, you know, in achieving this publication. Um, Nudrat in many ways is an example of the kind of alum and student that we'd like to have at GW Law School, especially in the area of investment arbitration. And it's so wonderful that we were surrounded by all these experts, you know, that were willing to work with Nudrat um, in this path as well. Um, I want to say that today I feel very honored, you know, I'm very privileged, you know, to be part of this event. We have some of the foremost um, and most important, you know, experts in the area of investment arbitration in the world today. And I'm very proud also of the fact that many of them are alums, are alums at GW Law School, are also professors at GW Law School. And right now we have an LLM concentration on international arbitration, mediation, and other forms of dispute resolution. So many of the panelists that we have here today really evidence, you know, the kind of work that you can do um, in this very intricate and interesting area of international law. Without further ado, I want to introduce, you know, our speakers for today. We first have Dr. Nudrad Pirasha, um, who is leading the legal team of Pakistan's first global firm, Samdani and Qureshi, uh, which is collab a collaborating firm of Anderson Global. She has served both as counsel and arbitrator in international investment arbitrations. She's also the founder of the first all-inclusive center for provision of all forms of appropriate dispute resolution training and services in the Pakistan International Center for appropriate dispute resolution and prevention. She's also a Fulbright Scholar, a Weinstein JAMS International Fellow, and the first lawyer from Pakistan to become a Fellow of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators. She's also the first woman in Pakistan to have qualified as an SJD holder, which is not a minor achievement. You know, it's something that we're very proud of as well. I also want to introduce Martina Polasek, who is actually the Deputy Secretary General of the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, ICSID, and she has been there for 20 years. She has a very lengthy career in investment arbitration, including working as an attorney for several law firms in Paris, France, and in Prague, the Czech Republic, and she's also our alum. That's something that we're very proud of. You know, she's actually an LLM holder of GW Law School, but also she has degrees from the University of Paris and also the University of Gothenburg and she's admitted to practice in Washington, D.C., and she speaks many languages. You know, she speaks English, French, Czech, and Swedish, which is pretty impressive as well. And then we have somebody in the panel that really does not need an introduction, but I'm going to give him an introduction, of course, is Judge Charles Brower. You know, his career in the law spans for 55 years, combining extensive practice at the bar with distinguished public service, both national and international, concentrating over 35 years in the fields of public international law and international dispute resolution. You know, he has been a judge of the Iran United States Claims Tribunal and a judge ad hoc in three cases before the International 
Court of Justice. He regularly hires UW law students also to work with him in his practice, something that we're extremely grateful for, all the mentoring that he keeps on giving our students and alums along the way. And he was also a distinguished visiting research professor of law at this uh, faculty. And he was also president of the American Society of International Law, and he has many accolades. You know, this is just a snapshot of what Judge Brower has. And we also have Professor Sean Murphy, who we are incredibly honored to have in our faculty. He's a member of the UN International Law Commission, for which he served as its special rapporteur for crimes against humanity, and also a member of l'Institut de droit international. Professor Murphy also served for 10 years uh, on the age -old board of editors and also as president of the American Society of international law. Many of you are very familiar with his writings in the area of international law, and he had a very distinguished career before, before becoming a professor for um, the State Department. He's also been an ad hoc judge, you know, for the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and he also has represented a number of countries, you know, litigating before international courts and tribunals. I'm also very happy to have here Kieran Gore, um, and Kieran is counsel in the law offices of Charles Camp, working on all facets of international dispute resolution. Over the past 10 years, she has developed tremendous expertise in public and private international law, foreign investment strategies, and international dispute resolution. She's also one of our own. She's a professor at GW Law School. She teaches in the area of global economy and international disputes, legal research and writing for our international LLM and MSL students. She's the coach of our BIS commercial arbitration mood team, and she also advises our SJD dissertation students. And last but not least, it is an honor to introduce Dr. Stanimir Alexandrov. He works as an arbitrator in treaty-based investor state disputes and international commercial arbitrations. He serves as an arbitrator in numerous cases and has been appointed to the panel of arbitrators of various arbitral institutions. He's also a professor at GW Law School, and he's also an SJD holder of GW Law School. And one thing that I can tell you is that his dissertation is still one of the most important dissertations ever, you know, issued or prepared by any SJD holder of this law school, we consider it a model, and we are so excited. We have been very excited to be able to see him also in his career and to still be very connected to Stanimir in many ways. I want to thank the American Society of International Law for co-sponsoring this event and for their collaboration, and also our student societies, the International Law Society and the International Arbitration Student Association for co-sponsoring this event. And we will now proceed, you know, with a presentation by Nudra Pirasha of the main findings of her book, and this will be followed by a discussion of more substantive aspects that will be moderated by Martina Pulasic. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Rosa. Uh, please allow me to begin, first of all, by expressing my gratitude to the publishers, Kruer uh, International, my friends and my mentors who have guided me through throughout the process, the organizers, the sponsors, the panel who is here today, and all of you who have found the time to attend this event. Uh, in particular, I would want to express my gratitude to George Washington University, not only for organizing this event, uh, but putting together a world-class panel and a world-class uh, committee for my SAD. For it is this research that I conducted during my SCT which forms the basis of this book. So to get into the book, uh, just by way of a bit of a background, um, I have worked for 17 years in the area of investment and commercial arbitration. And uh, before I came to US for my research, I found a disconnect uh, between what I was seeing in practice and all the criticism that uh, had hyped uh, against the investor state arbitrations. And there was a disconnect uh, as to what I was seeing and uh, what I was reading. Much of what I was reading was unsupported by statistics and sometimes by facts. I wanted to find out on my own, by my own research, as to what the truth behind that criticism was. Uh, initially, my research was extremely broad and um, 
uh, I was convinced that I would have to uh, narrow it down considerably. So I confined myself to the MFN clauses. The MFN clauses, they represent not only an important standard, but I found MFN clauses are one of the most contested and perhaps the most criticized standard. Uh, it is a standard about which the maximum number of dissents have been written. And uh, despite the literature that was there and all the decisions on MFN clauses, uh, I found that there was no clear answers as to the ambiguities that surrounded these clauses. So with MFN clauses, the most prominent uh, criticisms that I, I found one was um, relating to the infringement of sovereignty and the other one related to the inconsistency in the findings of the tribunals when interpreting these clauses. By infringement of sovereignty, I mean the criticism relating to the concern that perhaps tribunals have not been uh, sensitive to the interests of the state. They have engaged in an exercise of rewriting the treaties instead of interpreting them and exceeded their mandate. They have overextended the rights of the investors at the expense of uh, the states. And uh, in doing so, they have undermined the express will of the state. To my surprise, what the empirical and the legal research indicated was that the win of the investors on any kind of MFN claims was extremely low. And in some cases and some facets of MFN uh, that were raised by the investors, the investors have never succeeded. Similarly, when I looked at the inconsistency in the decisions, uh, prima facie, I, I did see that the tribunals have come out differently relating to two rational voluntatis conditions to MFM clause, uh, to a DSM clause, dispute settlement mechanism clause. Uh, sometimes they decided differently relating to the same rational voluntatis clause. And when I proceeded with my research, again, surprisingly, what I found was that there was terrible consistency between the tribunals, whether it was the liberal view or the conservative view, in trying to confine these clauses in a manner that perhaps was not supported by the international law resources or Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, VCLT. So there existed multiple rationales that I found uh, for why we were seeing uh, what we were seeing uh, in relation to these decisions. Uh, some of the academics and jurists attributed this to the background of the arbitrators. Some of them thought maybe it is uh, the aptitude of the arbitrators being investor friendly or state friendly. A more uh, reasonable uh, rationale for what we were seeing was that there are textual differences between the treaties, which of course would be a valid justification for different decisions. But what was most concerning to me was then the Germany-Argentina bit, where the same treaty has been decided differently by four different tribunals. Uh, and that raised the concern in my mind that is the discretion with vested in the tribunals so great that they are able to interpret the very same treaty and the very same terms differently. And I started thus my research from looking into the background and the history of MFN clauses as to how they have evolved over the years. And I found that the broad MFN clauses conventionally were meant to be broad unless they were confined by the treaty drafters. I found that the objective of these treaties, of these clauses was not only uh, to ensure that there is no need to sign a treaty in future every time a better treatment was extended to another beneficiary. The objective of these clauses was to ensure equality at all, all relevant times. So I started after the empirical analysis and um, the historical background looking into that. I looked into the legal framework that was relevant to interpreting these clauses. Uh, the most prominent, of course, being VCLT, on which there is consensus that that is the most relevant instrument to interpret these clauses. 
uh, I identified uh, four distinct approaches that tribunals have taken, namely textualism, contextualism, objectivism, purposivism, and intentionalism. Then looking at the guidance that has been provided by the International Law Commission, uh, I looked at uh, the value or the authoritative value of uh, this guidance. I looked at the guidance that is available by not only the ILC guidance that was provided in 1978, but report of the committee, which came out in 2015. After looking at uh, the legal framework, uh, a substantial part of the book uh, consists of the substantive analysis of how the tribunals have interpreted PMFN clauses. Uh, I looked at um, not only the exit cases, I looked at uh, uh, national cases, I looked at cases from panels of WTO, I looked at other parallel jurisdictions, uh, jurisprudences and regimes. And Looking at the way that ICSA tribunals in particular have uh, interpreted these clauses, uh, I first of all discuss where, in my view, they have erred in applying VCLT. Uh, so I argue that the tribunals, uh, in taking the crucible approach, they have put various elements of Article 31 and 32 into the crucible and have yielded different results depending on where they lay emphasis, on which element of Article 31 or 32 they lay emphasis, they are able to yield extremely different uh, results. So I look at then the canons of interpretation that tribunals have relied on. And these canons of interpretation, of course, were not made part of the BCLT. Yet there are competing uh, canons of interpretation and tribunals have picked and chose between these canons in a manner which allows them to come up with whichever verdict they deem proper. And uh, I raise questions and uh, raise issues in the book as to whether it is appropriate uh, for tribunals to have that kind of discretion to proceed without any sense of hierarchy between the elements of Article 31 and between Article 31 and 32. I look in particular uh, at the jurisdictional clauses, the procedural clauses, and how MFN uh, clauses have been applied to the jurisdictional and procedural issues. And what I found was that tribunals have overemphasized on elements that most probably could qualify under Article 31.3c of the VCLT, uh, such as issues relating to public policy or state consent. Uh, and I conclude that the tribunals, in fact, have engaged in an exercise of covertly applying the canon of interpretation relating to dubio mitius, which is to preserve the interest of the state. They have engaged in an exercise when taking a conservative view on strict interpretation uh, and a principle that Vienna Convention discourages. Similarly, when looking at the application of MFN clauses to the substantive standards and a claim of breach of the MFN standard, I found in case of a breach of MFN standard, the, the investor has never succeeded. And even on the cases where the investor had raised a claim uh, for uh, a better substantive treatment, their win actually is extremely low, as is supported by the empirical evidence. And I found that the tribunals have resorted to justifications, uh, they have resorted to tests, which are not supported by international law or the Vienna Convention. They have come up with tests like the justification test for states, uh, the like circumstances test. They have in, insisted on a subjective test to be imposed in these cases, uh, which most probably is imported from other regimes without taking into account the checks and balances that were available under those other regimes. So in this book, uh, in the last and concluding chapter, I provide certain principles or unifying principles, which I found uh, 
through my research and study to have been consistent throughout these years, I have been accepted by ILC in many of the states. So I propose that there is a need to have at least some unifying principles relating to the nature of broad MFN clauses and the manner in which these uh, clauses operate. I also suggest and make recommendations for tribunals and states in order to have a more balanced regime rather than having a regime that caters for the interests only of the states or only of the investors going forward. So uh, with that, I think I conclude my presentation. That is a very short synopsis of about five years of work. I, I wish I could make it shorter, but <laughs> thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Paracha. I'm so pleased and honored to be part of this exciting event, the launching of your book. It gives me particular pleasure because I know Nudrat well and I have um, closely followed her impressive career path. First as counsel into exit cases where I acted as the secretary of the tribunal. Then uh, as a Fulbright scholar, uh, in Washington while um, she was doing her SJD. And recently as a member on an ICRID Anomen Committee, uh, we have had countless lunches and dinners while she was in Washington, uh, during which I heard many passionate declarations about MFN clauses uh, to the point that I thought to myself, isn't she ever fed up with it? But that's the thing about Nudrats. Uh, if you know her well, you know that she is truly passionate about the law and that she's always optimistic, tenacious, and cheerful, whatever circumstances. In the most challenging circumstances, she's always had a very positive attitude. She truly amazes me as um, a lawyer, but also as a person. So congratulations, Nudrat. This, Thank you so much. This is a masterpiece. Thank you. Uh, when you started your work, I, um, I thought, what is she going to be saying about MFN that has not already been said? But you are really exceeded all expectations. You examined MFN clauses from all angles, a really 360 degree review. And you propose a really impressive and innovative approach um, to a very, really tough and controversial topic. Few topics have generated so much heat as the effect of MFN clauses in investment treaties. Even within the exit secretariat, I remember back in the days, um, we had spirited debates about Maffesini versus Spain and how uh, that affected the secretariat's screening process. That is, if there was manifest lack of jurisdiction with regard to certain MFN arguments. And we know that MFN has generated a lot of case law and many scholarly writings. And we also know that the topic has sometimes gotten arbitrators into trouble. For example, in Urbisler versus Argentina, an arbitrator was challenged because he had in two publications taken position on the question of the extension of a MFN clause to uh, procedural matters. And he had called the Maffesini decision, quote, heretical. I say this partly as words of caution because I do not want to get anyone into trouble today and especially our distinguished panelists who have been involved in some of the interesting uh, case law on the topic. I have a number of questions for them and I encourage the audience to also pose questions and do so in the chat box uh, and we will try to answer as many of the questions as our time allows. And finally, for those of you who are interested in purchasing a copy of the book, uh, I am posting a link in the chat box uh, and you also see a discount code which is available for all of those attending today. Now, the first question, 
uh, goes to the very issue that uh, Dr. Pirasha was describing, the, the inconsistency, inconsistency in the case law on MFN. New draft books really shows the different approaches that tribunals have taken on MFN. And some of these inconsistencies could be explained due to textual differences in the treaties rely on, but some are more difficult to explain. So for instance, uh, four cases that relied on the same bilateral investment treaty, the Argentina-Germany bit. Judge Brower, without going into anything confidential, what is in your view the reason for the inconsistent approaches that tribunals took? Different views on how to apply the Vienna Convention and on the law of treaties. And um, Kieran Gore is involved in a book to which I've contributed, which is an edited volume all about the Vienna Convention on the law of treaties. And I will say that most of my uh, dissenting opinions or sometimes concurring on juris, um, on, uh, on, on, um, on juris, well, anyway, dissenting contributions um, are based on um, what I feel is a failure to apply correctly the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Now, in the uh, four uh, Argentina-German uh, bit cases uh, to which uh, Nudrat referred, I have sat in three, and uh, so I, I, I bear the particular scars of inconsistency uh, of interpretations of the Most Favored Nation Clause in the very same treaty, uh, which is an extraordinary example of how people get things wrong. In two of them, the claimant got through fine, and in two of them, they got wiped out on the basis of the um, MFN uh, clause. Now, why did that happen? I think sometimes that arbitrators come um, partly in one case in particular, Pierre-Marie Dupuis in the um, Daimler Argentina case, because he is an academic international lawyer. He's practiced before the International Court of uh, Justice, but just has a, a different concept of how things uh, should work. Um, there were four cases in the Wintershall Aktiengesellschaft, which uh, I think was the first or close to the first, Actually, it was a, um, how should I say, a tribunal, which uh, certainly the majority of which was not really um, with it. It was chaired by an Indian, uh, a wonderful, wonderful uh, friend of all of us in international arbitration, but not an internationally, um, international law educated um, lawyer. They actually said, oh, well, if it was intended for an MFN clause to um, uh, access the dispute settlement provision of another treaty, it should have been in the article which established the dispute settlement provision under the, under the contract. Um, I've been known to say um, some years ago at an IBA International Arbitration Day, the purpose of an MFN clause is to destroy something that is in the treaty that contains it. Uh, you have to keep that in, uh, in mind. I sat in uh, Siemens versus uh, Argentina in which we had a unanimous um, decision. Y yes, the MFN clause there takes you to the, um, um, I believe it was Chile, uh, Argentina treaty so that you do not have to do, as uh, has been argued under the uh, German-Argentina Treaty, that you have to spend 18 months in an Argentine court uh, and with no result or a result that you don't like uh, before you can go to uh, our arbitration. Now, in Hochti versus uh, Argentina, it was a two-to-one decision of uh, um, myself and our uh, uh, chairman, or, or president, excuse me, of that uh, uh, tribunal saying, yeah, the uh, treaty of the MFN 
clause gets you there. It also read this 18-month provision very carefully as to not be obligatory unless one of the parties had requested it at the time, which Argentina had um, uh, had not. Daimler versus Argentina is one that upset me uh, uh, the most. Again, this was um, um, Pierre Marie Dupuis chairing, a lovely guy. I've, I've always, we've just been very good friends, but I couldn't fathom uh, that he was going to throw the case out uh, on the basis that the MFN clause didn't get you there, notwithstanding the fact that at that point, nine of the 11 cases um, uh, in relevant to this uh, issue had uh, found the um, MFN clause, frankly, to get you to, um, uh, get you to jurisdiction. Um, I can go into the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, but maybe that's another subject. Uh, some people, uh, and I'm one of those, believe it is hierarchical, uh, and others say, oh, no, you just, you know, take Article 31 and Article 32, and, you know, you just put it all together, and, and you come up with a, um, uh, a result. I will say one more thing. It's argued that it's important to have consistency. And I always cite Ralph Waldo Emerson, a 19th century uh, famous writer, who said, unreasonable consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. And that is a takeoff point for my view that consistency you would get with this uh, EU 15 uh, member proposed um, investment uh, court. But would you like it? A lot of people would not like it. Thank you. Thank you for those insights. Now, Nudrat's empirical research in chapter one of the book shows that states have prevailed in more cases on the MFN arguments than uh, uh, investors. On jurisdictional matters, uh, they prevailed, or investors prevailed in 18 out of 37 instances. Uh, and that's concerning conditions for access to dispute settlement. So that's roughly 50%. But on substantive matters, uh, investors were much less successful. Uh, in only 14 out of the 82 instances were they, were they able to expand substantive standards relying on an MFN clause. Professor Alexandrov, why do you think there is such a difference? Why? are investors not able to prevail in uh, substantive standards in particular? Thank you, uh, Martina. And while I'll have the floor, let me first thank all the participants, but most of all express my admiration for Nudrat's effort and research that has gone into a tremendous book. And I think you mentioned when I was asked by Nudrat first to supervise her dissertation and then Rosa asked me too, and I thought what's there on MFN that has not yet been said and written. And then when Nudrat gave me a 1200 page draft, I understood that there is a lot. Um, on, on your question, um, I want to build up a little bit on Judge Brower's remarks a moment ago because the answer to your question, Martina, um, also is relevant in the context of consistency or inconsistency of jurisprudence relating to the MFN clause. Um, and as Nudrat mentioned in her presentation, it's not the MFN clause, there are different MFN clauses worded differently in different treaties. Um, there are also different facts. Um, and I will take a second to give an example relating to a case that uh, for the time being I cannot name, but the case was about the domestic litigation requirement and the application of the MFN clause um, to that requirement. Um, and the respondent argued, well, the, the investor argued that there was no exception in the MFN provision for dispute settlement or for domestic litigation requirements whether it's a dispute settlement or procedural 
um, the state argued that there was no such an exclusion because at the time the bilateral investment treaty was entered into, nobody would fathom that later on Mafezini would come up and extend the application of the MFN clause to dispute settlement. So nobody even thought to include such, a, um, such an exception. Um, the investor, however, provided documents evidencing the parliamentary debate in that state um, on the, well, during the ratification of the bilateral investment treaty. And there were specific questions asked. Does the MFN clause in the treaty extend to dispute settlement? And if it does, what does it do to our domestic litigation requirement? And so the argument as on the facts of the case, the arguments that the parties to the bilateral investment treaty did not know enough um, to exclude or exempt from the scope of MFN domestic litigation requirement or dispute settlement um, was not persuasive anymore. So a lot depends on the facts of the case. Of course, the adjudicators uh, have discretion and of course inconsistencies are due to the views of the adjudicators and that's inherent in any legal system as Judge Brower pointed out. And I'll supplement his example by saying that in, in the year 2000, uh, many after the Supreme Court decided the case of Gore versus Bush, um, there were publications saying that had the composition of the Supreme Court of the United States been different, Al Gore would have uh, probably become president of the United States. So yes, there is a, a certain discretion and you know, the outcome depends on the adjudicators. Um, having said that, is jurisprudence inconsistent as far as um, the application of the MFN clause to jurisdictional matters versus substantive matters and why the statistics show different outcomes? Um, I think a couple of reasons. One is when we say jurisdictional, as you all know, and as Nudrat has um, amply discussed in her book, um, some of those requirements are seen as jurisdictional, but others have characterized the same requirements as procedural. Whether we are talking about the, um, you know, the uh, cooling off period or the domestic litigation requirement. And um, whether we draw a distinction or not uh, for the purposes of this discussion, it would be interesting to see the rate of success of um, investors separately with respect to procedural requirements when the tribunal agreed they are procedural and with respect to jurisdictional requirements when the tribunal decided that the MFN um, covers or extends to or doesn't extend to the scope of consent. Um, and to me, that's, um, that is one reason why there is such a disparity because um, the success may be mixed in the context of procedural requirements when they were characterized by the tribunals as procedural. And it's a different rate of success when the requirements are seen as jurisdictional and the application of the MFN clause as perceived to extend to the scope of consent. And I also want to point, so the, the rate of success is higher in part because um, what is characterized as jurisdictional is sometimes seen as procedural. The second reason in my view is um, investors, particularly after PLAMA, um, don't undertake a wholesale effort to bring in a whole dispute settlement mechanism from one treaty into another. There is a general perception that this effort will inevitably fail. So most MFN uh, arguments in investor state arbitration cases focus on cooling off periods and uh, domestic litigation requirements where, again, they have a much better chance of success than the situation that existed in Plama, um, with which I would say the vast majority of uh, commentators, there is with the result of which the vast majority of the commentators agree. Um, so that, in my view, explains this disparity in the statistics. Thank you. Uh, Professor Alexandrov, you mentioned some textual differences in treaties and the importance of them. 
Now, Dr. Parash's book suggests some unifying principles when interpreting general MFN clauses. Now, given these textual differences, can there be a unified legal regime uh, regarding the effects of general MFN clauses? And if so, how can that be reconciled with fundamental principles of international law, since each bilateral investment treaty is a separate legal instrument and the wording varies? Professor Murphy, can you speak about that? Sure. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, let me also say thanks to you, Martina, for moderating this uh, event, and thanks to Rosa for the invitation to be a part of what is a very illustrious panel, and thanks to the sponsors for the event, and, and special thanks to Nudrat for creating this book that we're all very interested in and here to talk about. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so on your question, um, Martina, about whether uh, we really can apply unified um, principles or unified legal regime to uh, uh, MFN clauses. Uh, I, I guess I would start by saying I wouldn't rush to the idea of doing unified legal principles if I were trying to interpret an MFN clause. I, I think the central issue for the interpreter uh, is and should be what was the intent of the parties to the instrument that's before you, which often will be a bilateral investment treaty, but obviously could be some other kind of instrument that has an MFN clause. And I, I think in the first instance, although I'm not really going to talk about hierarchy here, but in the first instance, I think it's natural to focus on the specific treaty text. Um, you know, an MFN clause can come in different shapes and forms, and one really needs to zero in on what does the text actually say, um, what is the context in which that text is being used, what's the object and purpose of the instrument, you know, those standard uh, Article 31, Paragraph 1 elements of uh, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Um, but at some point, you do move past that you move past the, the the text of the treaty and you do start thinking about other things. Um, one thing might be the practice of the parties under the treaty. And that's certainly picked up in Article 31, Paragraph 3, Paragraphs A and 2 of, of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Have the parties in the course of the life of the treaty acted in a certain way that interprets the meaning of the MFN clause. Um, but even beyond that, I think it's fair game to look at other instruments the parties have done inter se between each other, where maybe there's some kind of uh, light to be shed on what did they intend in this MFN clause, and possibly even their instruments with third parties. This is a little bit more uh, questionable um, but if you could see some kind of consistent practice operating vis-a-vis -vis other instruments, maybe that too would be fair game to shed light on, on the understanding of this clause that's in front of you. Um, at some point as well, of course, you also have this possibility of turning to the broader canvas of international law upon which this instrument has uh, been built. Uh, and this, of course, is Article 31, Paragraph 3C of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which says that it's fair for the interpreter to look at any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties. So why are we able to use the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties? Well, it's because of that, right, that, that you do turn to other things particularly secondary rules like rules on the law of treaties or rules on state responsibility as um, basically understood to be part of the panorama uh, within which an instrument was developed and the parties understood that and, and intended for it to be applied um, in the context of interpreting that particular clause. Um, it's an interesting question, I think, when you talk about a bilateral instrument versus a multilateral instrument, do, does the, the weighing of these things change a little bit? One could imagine in the bilateral context, 
being perhaps even more focused on the, the intent of the parties, the, the drafting, the, because it's these two, when you move to the multilateral level and you have 30, 40, 50 parties, uh, maybe it gets a little harder to dig in on sort of the individual intent and it, and it pushes more towards the broader panorama of international law. It's, it's, it's something worth thinking about. Um, I, I, Nudrat mentioned at the outset the sort of canons of interpretation issue, and, and I think in particular her feeling that the indubio medius uh, principle is being overused. Uh, it's interesting to recall that when the International Law Commission was developing its draft articles on the law of treaties, uh, the first two special rapporteurs, James Brierley and Ellie Louder, uh, Hirsch Louderpack, were very doubtful, very skeptical about these canons of construction. And it was only the third special rapporteur, Fitzmaurice, who came along and said, well, yeah, but there are, there should have be an ability to separate out the general canons of construction from the more specialized ones and use those general canons as interpretive rules. And that's where the final special rapporteur on the, product, on the project Humphrey Waldock ended up going. He said, there are some general canons, canons of interpretation. Let's put those in what are now articles 31 to 33, actually of the, of the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. Um, but these other things, like in Dubio Midius, no. <laughs> and why? Because, you know, as Carl Llewellyn suggested in, in talking about US law, common law in this context, you can marry up all of those canons with a competing canon and it, it just becomes maybe useful ways of thinking, but it's a little bit doubtful to lean heavily on any one of those. So I tend to agree with Nudrat on that. But let me finish by just saying, um, should we lean heavily on uh, unified rules relating to MFN clauses? I think the reason the book is kind of exciting is that that is in fact what it's urging us to do. And in fact, trying to identify what those rules are. And I think uh, the impact of the book will be on whether it persuades us that these rules are there and should be used by the interpreter. I will note that the title of the book is Toward Uniformly Accepted Principles, Toward Them which suggests maybe we're not quite there yet. And if they're not uniformly accepted, um, then it's less clear that a interpreter today should be relying upon them because it seems to me we need acceptance by states of these principles in order to then use them to shed light on the intent of states in crafting a particular MFN clause in a particular uh, instrument. It all gets back to what was that intent. And if the parties don't have the intent that Nudrod has in mind here, it's less obvious to me that it's an appropriate um, step for the interpreter to be taking in deciding what a particular MFN clause means. Thanks. Thank you. That's a very good point. Let's uh, stay on the topic of the Vienna Convention. Chapter four of the book discusses uh, tribunals' applications of um, articles 31 to 33 uh, to MFN clauses. And it concludes that tribunals have departed from the principle of the Vienna Convention and have narrowed the meaning um, of general and broad MFN clauses. And according to Nudrat, tribunals fail to consider the proper hierarchy under Article 31 of the Vienna Convention. Professor Gore, how do you believe the Vienna Convention ought to be applied? Should there be a hierarchy between the elements in Article 31.1 of the Vienna Convention, good faith, uh, context, and object and purpose? Thank you so much, Martina, for the question. Um, before, before I answer it, I, I want to maybe take us to a 50-foot view of um, interpretation and application and, and how that leads to the decisional context that we're in today. And I also really want to 
just congratulate Nudrat. I'm so excited to have a copy of her book right here too, just like all the other panelists. And really, aside from the achievements that she's she's made with respect to MFN clauses in particular on a substantive basis, what I'm always impressed by with Nudrat is her inquisitive nature and her enthusiasm. And, and I find her to be an inspiration on that, on that point. And I hope that the ideas she's reached illuminate ISDS and some of the challenges to the ISDS system more broadly. So I actually want to start there. Um, Nothred's done a niche and comprehensive study on MFN clauses and their application and interpretation, but the concerns that she identifies in these clauses, and also in particular in chapter four, actually resonate more broadly with the systemic issues that we're seeing in ISDS at the moment. Um, recent years, we've seen a backlash against investment arbitration, and that's really the shorthand way of describing um, the discontent and disenchantment by states with the system as a whole. But it's more than just discontent, it has practical ramifications. So many states are now rejecting or retreating from investment arbitration by various means. Those means might be dramatic, um, such as denunciation of the ICSID convention or termination of certain bits or they may be more subtle um, and leading to fragmentation of the system, such as by excluding ISDS and future treaties that they're implementing and negotiating or recalibrating the dispute resolution mechanisms that those treaties provide. And I think Judge Brower started to touch upon some of this. The core of that backlash in, in my personal perspective lies in the perception by states of unfairness, one-sidedness of the system or negative experiences of those states in high profile or numerous claims. And that's really what I think drew Nudrat to focus on MFN clauses. Um, in support of those criticisms, a lot of states cite inconsistency in arbitral decisions, um, encroachment on their right to regulate, the ad hoc nature of investment arbitration, and then conflicts that, that may result um, with respect to certain arbitrators or their past publications in the way that Martina described in her introductory remarks. So in response to Martina's question, um, I'd like to propose that these criticisms are unsurprising given the trends identified by Nudrat in her book with respect to MFN clauses. Um, if state parties have negotiated and agreed in treaties to an MFN provision and tribunals do not correctly interpret that MFN provision, um, in Nudrat's words, she describes that as usurping the discretion that was vested in state parties, states parties to define the terms of the treaty and the substantive protections it offers to investors. So with all that context in mind, the question really is, you know, as you put it, Martina, what are the correct and proper approaches to interpretation? Well, surely the VCLT provides core guidance. Um, and I know we have a lot of students in the audience, so I'll maybe start by comprehensively introducing the VCLT. It's, it was adopted and open for signature in 1969, but did not enter into force until 1980. And in those 50, approximately 50 years since, it's become universally regarded as the most important instrument on treaty law. It's been ratified by 116 states. Um, the US is not one of them, but it recognizes parts of the VCLT as restatement of customary international law. So I think we are in a place that the VCLT is our guiding instrument for interpretive processes. And as Professor Murphy, Murphy mentioned, Articles 31 through 33 provide those tools to be applied. Article 31 overall, in my view, encourages a textualist approach, whereby the text of the treaty must first be considered to determine the party's con common intention. So, so in that sense, Article 31 one provides that treaty should be interpretive and Nudrat describes four elements of it. Good faith in the ordinary meaning of the treaty's terms in their context and in the light of its object and purpose. These are four distinct parts. Um, one could call them four distinct interpretive tools, but I don't think that's possible to employ those bits within Article 31.1 with any hierarchy. Um, that's mainly because, for example, and Nudrat says this in her book too, and I agree with her, good faith interpretation cannot be yielded without also looking at ordinary meaning, context, or the treaty's object and purpose. So it needs to be taken together um, rather than separately. So I would say that everything within Article 31.1 is a singular tool. Um, but as Nudrat explains, you could end up with a restrictive interpretation that thereby denies rights provided under a treaty. So the good faith 
principle should be employed throughout the interpretive process, I would say. I would argue that the same applies when considering the other elements of Article 31.1. And I might even go further to argue that if all four aspects are applied in a singular interpretive tool rather than independently, it could help reduce inconsistency in ISDS decisions. It's just my own view. But if you do look at the backlash, much of which does come from the lack of, con lack of consistency, um, looking at the interpretive tools and applying them in a way that leads towards consistency can be useful. All that said, I think there's a broader hierarchical challenge with respect to Articles 31, 32, and 33, um, and, I, and also a, a further hierarchical challenge between subparts of 31.1. So we don't only have just 31.1. Um, with respect to those, I certainly see a hierarchy. So, so to answer your question maybe more succinctly, I think Article 31.1 has no hierarchy. I think it's a singular interpretive tool, but there is without a doubt um, hierarchy with amongst the broader subparts of um, the interpretive section of the BCLT. Thank you. Well, let's let's stay on Article 31 and go to the subparagraphs. Um, in particular, Article 31.3c. Should all the elements uh, of the Vienna Convention have the same weight in, in that? Um, the, the various sources of law like treaties, customary international law, general principles of international law, decisions of courts and arbitral tribunals and scholarly writings. Can you talk about that? I, I would say that there should be a hierarchy there um, for sure because as Nisbet mentioned in her, introdu in her introductory remarks, our, our, our goal, um, while consistency for the sake of consistency is certainly not a goal, our goal certainly is to affect the party's intent. And, and there's express, and if you look at the travaux, the, the drafting and, and other preparatory work that went into the VCLT, it was expressly to um, provide interpretive tools for written agreements between states parties, not, not other kinds of agreements that might be oral or, or otherwise reflected. And so taking that in mind, I think we, we certainly should look at the various parts of three with hierarchy. Um, and, and I would, I might introduce a new or an emerging criticism of the VCLT or, or how it should be applied is, well, what about subsequent agreements between the parties? What about inter joint interpretive notes, for example? I think we can all agree that if states who have entered into a treaty, a bilateral investment treaty, or even a multilateral one, if they then subsequently issue an, a joint interpretive note um, on how to guide review of that treaty and interpretation of that treaty, do we then apply the VCLT to the interpretive note? Um, is, is that a, tr a treaty for purposes of, of this discussion and how, how does that play into the elucidating process to ensure that the state's party's intent is, is properly applied and interpreted and the rights that they sought through their sovereignty to guarantee is actually affected. That might be the challenge for somebody else's dissertation. <laughs> Oh, I think you're on mute, Martina. Sorry, thank you. Now, according to uh, Dr. Pirasha, many tribunals um, have relied on public policy considerations when dealing with the MFN clauses. How does that fit into the scheme, in particular with regard to Article 31 of the Vienna Convention and some of the interpretive theories that uh, Nudrat identifies in the book? Uh, Judge Brower, would you um, like to address that? <clears throat> uh, I don't see that subject anywhere in um, Article 31, 32, or 33, frankly. Um, <clears throat> but it creeps in in some of the uh, uh, some of the interpretations uh, that have made, been made, I think, wrongly in a case entitled. Um, Austrian Airlines versus uh, Slovakia, in uh, which I sat appointed by um, Austrian uh, uh, Airlines. The, um, my view was that the MFN clause uh, should have um, uh, taken you to another treaty, as I recall, substantive provisions. 
um, but I was uh, <laughs> I was outruled by my two colleagues <clears throat> who saw that the uh, or original treaty um, had been a Czechoslovak uh, treaty before the um, famous um, um, uh, departure of, of the two states from each other, um, the Velvet Divorce, I guess that, that was referred to, <clears throat> looked at the uh, treaty, which was somewhat aged and had a very uh, distinct uh, provision with respect to um, expropriation uh, that was, um, it was an old provision, it was an older uh, treaty. And the majority said, well, they have such a strong provision about that, which is not favorable to uh, claimants. They can't possibly have meant the um, MFN clause to um, uh, apply uh, to bring in a different expropriation provision from a from a more modern uh, from a more modern treaty. Well, to me, that's sort of a kind of a, a public interest uh, idea um, that motivated uh, people. I don't think it's a proper. I didn't think it was a proper application of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. The public interest comes in under the police power, basically. In, uh, in in treaties, and I don't think it's an aspect of um, of uh, interpretation, unless for any reason uh, there should be something under thirty one three C relevant rules of international law applicable, um, or well, I guess under the uh, A and B as well if they've interpreted the treaty. But you have to be careful. I'm, I'm very wary of interpretations uh, since the uh, NAFTA uh, interpretation in the midst of the um, Pope and Talbot uh, case, which uh, said, oh, no, no, FET doesn't mean uh, anything more than um, um, customary international law. And they want to go back to the Near case in the, uh, in the, in the 1920s. Both Steve Schwabel and Robbie Jennings have made it uh, uh, clear uh, in different uh, uh, forms and that was an unconstitutional revision of the treaty. It wasn't an interpretation. And I'm always entertained by the fact that that interpretation had been urged in the Pope and Talbot case by Canada and was rejected unanimously by the tribunal as being, quote, patently absurd, end quote. So we have to be careful of interpretations as well, which are becoming very popular in new uh, bilateral investment treaties. Thank you, thank you. Now moving on, um, the chapter three of the book discusses the ILC articles on um, most favored nation clauses and concludes that they give valuable interpretive guidance. Professor Murphy, can you tell us a little bit more about what it is and what, what is the status of that guidance? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, there's actually been two projects at the International Law Commission on MFN clauses. Uh, the first project began back in 1967 and lasted for almost a decade. Um, with the ILC appointing um, special rapporteurs that drafted black letter rules, articles, um, and associated commentary. And that project went through a first reading in 1976, which is where the commission sends the entire project to the General Assembly and asks for comments by states um, and then returns to it to years later, 1978, to do the second and final reading of what ultimately was 30 draft articles with commentary um, and also with a recommendation by the International Law Commission to the General Assembly that the project be transformed into a convention. So the idea was this would be sort of like the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, but it's going to be on MFN. Uh, clauses instead. Um, the uh, General Assembly received the project, um, asked for reactions by governments, 
Uh, they spent many years talking about whether it should become a new uh, convention or not. And eventually the decision was taken in 1991 uh, not to pursue it as a convention. Uh, instead, the General Assembly thanked the ILC for its work, commended the work to the attention of governments and international organizations uh, to the extent uh, they deemed it appropriate. So a little bit of a acknowledgement that there was some questions being raised by governments about, um, about the project. Um, that was the first project. The second project was much more recently in 2008, the commission again decided to look at the MFM clause. And this time, instead of appointing a special rapporteur, it created a study group chaired by Donald McRae uh, and for a period of time by Rohan Pereira, uh, which met annually for about seven years and ultimately produced a final report of the study group, uh, which also included five uh, recommendations or five uh, conclusions referred to as summary conclusions. Um, and what's important to note in that context is that the commission as a whole um, welcomed the report, but did not adopt the report it adopted the five summary conclusions. So if you're looking for what was the ILC's take as a whole, it's just those five summary conclusions. The whole thing was sent to the General Assembly um, with a recommendation that the Assembly uh, simply bring it to the attention of others. Uh, so no request this time to be turned into a convention um, and uh, it just is a project that uh, you know others have have looked at and uh, and thought about. Um, so the overall status uh, these are clearly not treaty instruments. Um, they are not in and of themselves customary international law. Uh, they are, I think, useful analyses by a body of experts uh, drawn from around the world of the law in this area, citing to jurisprudence, treaty instruments, lots of other things. And moreover, done in the context of being in a relationship with governments. Uh, the ILC isn't just this body off on the side, it, it's in a, you know, it has a synergy uh, with states because it sends its projects to states and the states react to it and the ILC modifies it along the way. Um, so, you know, the status is somewhere between, I guess, uh, writings of publicists and um, the sort of traditional sources of international law. It has a little bit of a, of a bump up maybe. I'll finish by just saying one thing and that is I was on the study group for the second project, um, and it was certainly motivated in part by Mafazini v. Spain and the subsequent um, arbitral tribunals that were going different directions on whether the MFN should allow for incorporation of substantive rules. And um, our study group uh, we had differing views about it. Some thought Mafazini's right, some thought it was wrong. We were kind of going back and forth. But the bottom line ended up being um, we weren't going to take a position uh, that instead we were going to reiterate that the VCLT is where you need to go to sort these things out. And different treaty provisions are going to be written in different ways and have a different intent behind them. That needs to be the focus rather than some broad claim by the ILC as to what the right rule is. I mention that just because it cuts a little bit against Udra's thesis, right? The ILC at least was reluctant to attempt to put forward a uniform rule that would resolve that kind of an issue. And I think that's just a relevant observation. Thanks. Thank you. Now, as uh, uh, Dr. De Pirasha explained, she um, has come forward with certain uh, unifying principles about the limit and nature of MFN obligations as part of international law. And uh, part of these principles is that MFN clauses can create new rights. 
Professor Alexandrov, what are your views on Nudrat's proposed principles, and in particular that MFN clauses can create new rights? Thank you, Martina. The, the way I want to address this question, given the limited time that we have, is to share an anecdote from my personal experience, uh, which in my mind, to a large extent, answers the question. Um, and it's an experience from my previous life. Uh, when I was a um, junior lawyer um, in a small country where the economy was uh, centrally planned. Um, I'm talking about the period of the early 80s. And at that time, there was a decision to conduct an economic experiment. Um, I think now thinking back about it, that it was an experiment um, that was at the minimum approved and probably encouraged by um, you know, the Soviet Union to see what will happen to an economy if it begins to open up and whether that will lead to some improvement. Um, so there was an experimental, I call it, opening up of the economy in the early 80s. And that op the first step of the opening up of the economy was um, the, a law was passed that allowed foreign companies to create joint ventures with local companies of up to 50% ownership. Um, and in 2021, it's hard to appreciate how revolutionary this was in 1982. Um, but it was revolutionary at the time. And what happened was immediately, and when I say immediately, I mean within a couple of months, Western European countries came and said, here is our draft bilateral investment treaty. Let us sit down and talk negotiate and enter into a bilateral investment treaty because, and they were very open about it, because you're opening up now, but we don't trust your judiciary, we don't trust your law, and we are not going to take advantage of this opening, and you're going, not going to benefit from it unless we have international protections for our investors. So we end up negotiating our first bilateral investment treaties, and I am a very junior lawyer, the only lawyer in the negotiating team. Um, I guess it tells you a little bit about the attitude towards law at that time. Um, but um, the first, I remember, the very first were the Dutch. They were followed by then the West Germans and then the French and then the Spaniards and the Italians, all in a matter of less than six months. And the Dutch came and we started negotiating. We have zero experience. They have plenty of experience. And we start talking about national treatment and MFN treatment. And, and they say, here is our proposal for a national treatment uh, provision. Um, and I said, and, and this is an anecdote I'm sharing with my students um, because I think they find it interesting, but I, I want to share it with you too. They said, well, here is our uh, proposal for national treatment. And I said, be my guests. But right now, the domestic actors um, manufacture, um, sell whatever they are told by the planning committee at whatever price the planning committee tells them. So that's the national treatment that you'll be enjoying. Um, they said, yes, but tomorrow you will pass new legislation that will grant more rights to your domestic actors. The day after tomorrow, you continue opening up the economy. And we want to make sure that as you're granting um, more liberal opportunities, economic opportunities, and more rights to your domestic actors, we get to enjoy them as well, because otherwise we'll be left behind. And then they said, here is our draft for an MFN clause. Um, and I said, again, we'll be my guest, but this is our first bilateral investment treaty. And they said, yes. This is your first bilateral investment treaty, but we know the Germans are knocking on the door and the Spaniards are knocking on the door and the French are knocking on the door. And your bilateral investment treaties will change over time. And as they change over time, we don't want to suffer because we are the first. And so we do want to include an MFN clause, not only to make sure we are treated 
um, in the same way as the others in terms of tax rates and so on and so forth, but also to take advantage of your future bilateral investment treaties that will certainly be more investor friendly as you're opening up if this trend, trend continues. And, and so it happened that after a hiatus, I came back and started negotiating bilateral investment treaties 10 years later in the early 90s, um, when the economy was already, well, they called it then a transition economy, but it was an economy transforming itself on a market basis. And I remember 10 years ago what they told me, and indeed, our bilateral investment treaties had changed dramatically. And their view at the time was they were taking advantage of that evolution of our treaties because they didn't want to suffer as a result of being the first ones. So I, I leave the audience to draw its own conclusions, but that is my answer to your question. Thank you very much for sharing that uh, anecdote. It gives a really interesting perspective, uh, historic. So um, we have some, some questions in the chat box and I thought I would jump to those. Um, and I thought I'd ask um, Dr. Pirvasha. Um, there is one that's um, asked, should there be a complete harmonization of MFN clauses in BITS and MFN clauses found in international trade agreements? Is that even possible? I seem to see sort of a trend more to restrict MFN clauses in, in some newer bits. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Karasha? Yes, thank you so much. Um, uh, I do see uh, a trend that uh, there are uh, MFN clauses in multilateral treaties in particular. So they are retaining those MFN clauses, but to a very limited extent, uh, they are providing a long, long list of exemptions uh, from the MFN clause. Uh, so over the years, I feel that MFN clauses are being constrained and confined by the treaty doctrine. And of course, that is the state's right if they want to confine these clauses. So there is, in that sense, uh, some harmonization already towards having much more confined MFN clauses. Uh, but I think a more important question uh, or as I understand it, that needs to be addressed in the harmonization of MFN clauses uh, is even if you had a harmonized clause, let's say all the treaties uh, read that the investor shall be treated no less favorably. The issue is not with, in my mind, that much uh, with the text that is used, but the fact that the tribunals uh, may come back and in the same treaty, in let's say in the same FTA, they might come back and interpret uh, treatment differently, right? So what has happening, happened so far is uh, you take the same word uh, in different treaties. Yes, one might be able to argue that it was because of the circumstances and other considerations, uh, but sometimes there are no considerations as such that are discussed, but the tribunal still uh, interpret differently the word treatment or the treatment less favorable or uh, territory or uh, for instance if there is all matters written in this harmonized MFN clause uh, one tribunal might might consider all matters uh, refers to and uh, uh, extends to the DSM clause and yet another tribunal might come back to you and say uh, you know what I think all matters does not apply to the DSM clause so even if there were harmonized MFN clauses, until and unless there is some uniformity as to the understanding of the broader MFN clauses and the way they operate, we will continue to see these problems even with these harmonized MFN clauses. Thank you. Another question for you. Um, was there any ex expectation that you had as you started the research that proved to be different during the course of the research? After completing the research, are you more optimistic about the chances of achieving uniformity on this subject? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I think uh, what was unexpected was really the amount of work that I had to do. 
I had started off thinking that all you need to do is write 150 pages uh, to qualify for your SAT. Uh, I initially ended up with about 3,000 pages. Uh, I reduced it to single space, 1,300 <laughs> pages. Uh, and uh, when I had started, I was not anticipating uh, that I would have to uh, go into such depth and look at uh, these competitive analysis and um, these different regimes that could be relevant. Uh, so the amount of work involved, I definitely think that was quite unexpected. Uh, and as to my optimism about the change, I do think uh, what is important is uh, uh, whether or not uh, there is uniformity at the end of the day. It is important to be asking the right questions. And that is one of the aims of the book that I want to steer the debate in the right direction. I want people to be thinking about, about these things that perhaps they are not talking about. Uh, just trying to explain it away, um, explain the inconsistency away on the basis of uh, maybe textual differences or uh, differences in the attitude of the arbitrators or they're being investor or state friendly. Uh, that is not really going to the heart of the problem. Uh, the heart of the problem is somewhere else. And that is uh, a problem that is not only relevant to the MFN clauses, but it goes to the heart of the, the whole legitimacy debate uh, with interpretation of other standards. Are the tribunals making the same mistake? Uh, is there a need uh, to then consider the issues that have been identified by the book? So my ambition uh, with this book uh, is not to revolutionize uh, the whole regime, but uh, at least get people thinking in the right direction. Where is actually the fault? and what needs to change. Thank you so much. Any last uh, thoughts from our panelists uh, before we move to closing remarks? May I just add Martina to yes. Nudrat's last answer and she may be um, too um, humble to say that, but when we talk about harmonization of the MFN clause, um, there are two distinct levels. One is consistency in interpreting the MFN clause, which she touched upon in her answer. And the other one is harmonizing the MFN clauses in various agreement, which is a subject of negotiations. And I think one of the points which I found very interesting in Nudrat's book is um, not so much the interpretation of MFN clauses, which she focused on in her answer, but also the harmonization of MFN clauses as a matter of negotiations between various parties, whether it's bilateral and multilateral agreements. And there is a question, of course, whether that is possible, given that this is a matter of sovereignty of different states who negotiate those clauses. But the, the other question that she has raised in her book, which I find very interesting is, is that even desirable? So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, with that, we'll move to closing remarks by uh, Rosa Celorio. Thank you so much, Martina, for your wonderful moderation. I want to thank all of our panelists today. Particularly, I want to thank and congratulate Nudred again for this groundwork, this groundbreaking contribution to the realm of investment arbitration. And I also want to thank all of you for your continued collaboration, even in difficult times, even though we're still in a pandemic. It's wonderful to see all of you connected to our virtual events. And I leave you today with a message of health and wellness hoping that soon we will be able to meet again in person. And I want to thank our co-sponsors as well, the American Society of International Law, International Law Society, and International Arbitration Student Society. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much for joining us again. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, and congratulations, Nadrat. Thank you so much, Martina. Congratulations from Ruth. It was wonderful. Thank Sorry you. I couldn't appear on video. It's a long story. Thank, thank you. you so it's wonderful. Thank you. Nudra, thank you so much from the Weinstein Gems Fellowship Program and the Weinstein International Foundation. We're so pleased to be able to participate and for all of your groundbreaking research. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen. 
Thank you, Mildred. And congratulations once again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nudred. I'm so proud of you. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.